So uh, again, my name is Jeff Mucci. I'm CEO of Enterprise IoT Insights and RCR Wireless News. We're going to do a panel about building a smarter building. And uh, we have a friend, Todd Landry, from JMA Wireless. Todd, good to it's good to here. see you. Good to be here, Jeff. Seems like we see each other a lot. Most recently, we were in um, Barcelona. That's right. And um, you had these waste cans, trash bins, in your booth, which was really big trash cans. That's right. What was that all about? <laughs> And what is a wireless infrastructure company doing with uh, trash cans in our in our booth at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona? So, um, so it's funny because we we've been embarking on smart solutions, uh, and we deliver technology in a variety of different environments. In this case, it was focused on urban environments. Now, if you think of waste cans, they actually show up in city streets at very, at pretty consistent intervals, right? And they happen to be where people are. Uh, in this case, they were uh, waste management stations from an organization called Big Belly. Uh, we partnered with Big Belly because uh, in our uh, stand at the show, right next to the waste station, was an equipment cabinet. Now, the benefit of the equipment cabinet, and what we often don't talk about in IoT and smart stuff, is how do you actually get it in the places that you need to have it in, right? And in this case, uh, what we were showcasing at this event is how a range of different technologies could be located in street furniture at intervals on the street, city streets. So in the most basic sense, I've got cellular amplifiers that we showcase mounted in there. They can drive local antennas on a mast right off the big belly, or they can micro-trench over to a light post and have cellular off of there. But it also becomes a place for a range of different sensors, whether they're gunshot sensors, camera type devices, uh, beacon type devices for location, or even advertising. So that was really a part of our initiative uh, that we've been starting for kind of smart urban solutions. Mm -hmm. So how far away are we from uh, commercialization of Big Belly? So the Big Belly product uh, as a way station is deployed in some 50 countries today. If you look for it, you'll probably see it, but normally we don't go looking for waste stations. Uh, you will, trust me, the next time you walk down the streets of Austin, you'll see some big bellies mounted there. Now, uh, we're a matter of months away from running the first pilots and deployments in major U.S. cities of these stations with wireless equipment in uh, which means that we can deploy wireless equipment in locations, again, where it disappears. Uh, the importance of that is that uh, the complexity of getting through city officials is diminished because they look at it and they say, oh, that's an easy one. You're not hanging some special equipment from a building or from a pole or adding some new thing to my sidewalk. So we'll be deploying that uh, here and running the first pilots here in the next couple months. Uh, it'll be a multi-operator solution, which is another big thing for the cities because the people across the cities uh, use a variety of different types of mobile devices and they will use a variety of different IoT devices. So everything we deploy will be IoT ready in terms of things like LTE CAT M1 and narrowband IoT. Well, last time I checked, this, this session's about smart buildings or building a smart building. So what are some of the key components of a smart building? Maybe you can help connect the dots yeah. um, in terms of how these external small cells, or whatever you want to call them, sure. uh, fit into that smart building equation. Yeah, and, and we often talk about um, smart everything nowadays, smart buildings, smart cities, uh, smart campuses. Um, and if you really look at uh, what's happening in building, we do, we do hundreds and hundreds of in-building deployments for wireless infrastructure. Uh, every quarter and as a result of that one of the things we're learning is that infrastructure can be utilized for many different things so um, you can utilize cellular front-end services to drive <coughs> urban street level capabilities as well as in building capabilities which means we get leverage across those two environments many of you think about being in a city and at some point in the morning the streets are quite full at some point, kind of mid-morning, the buildings are quite full. 
lunchtime, the streets are quite full. So you have a lot of elasticity that happens. So we're really designing our systems to leverage common infrastructure and be more elastic between these two. Now, when we go in building, uh, one of the things we've been talking a lot are things like heterogeneous powered optical networks, HPOM, right? A four-letter term we invented really to talk about common infrastructure that goes to different service nodes inside of these buildings. And those service nodes can not only be deployment points for cellular coverage, but they can also be access points or service points for IoT gateways. They can be access points for security cameras. They can be access points for um, other forms of IP or PoE type connected devices. So more and more of this, this stuff is coming together as a heterogeneous solution inside these buildings and we're, we're taking out more and more of that every day. So people have been talking about uh, smart buildings forever. Um, you know, two decades ago I worked with a, a group that was, we provided in-building communication services. It was the, ironically, the old IBM shared computing business and 100 million square feet across the country. The PCs destroyed that compute business, but fundamentally we're coming right back to intelligent building systems and my question is what role will this connectivity and this leverageability play into an intelligent building system <clears throat> yeah we we heard you know earlier today discussions about uh, mobile edge computing uh, you know we live in an industry that talks about everything going to the cloud uh, if we if you live in the cellular wireless infrastructure a lot of discussion today about something called CRAM centralized or cloud-based RAM technology. As we move towards things like 5G, uh, and we move towards the desire to get intelligence out of the network, you have to get some level of intelligence out to the edges. So, you know, similar to the world's, uh, uh, the winds of shift from, from personal computing to centralized computing, I think we're seeing the same thing in the mobile infrastructure where uh, you know, I think the observation this morning from uh, Intel was correct and in that we're going to see the need for that computing to move towards the edge. Now, to add to that, one of the things as we're talking about computing, one of the interesting things that's really occurring in the mobile industry, and maybe, maybe it's the last um, uh, part of the evolutionary process because we, we saw other technology industries make their way to software. We're now seeing the mobile industry and its core infrastructure really making its move to an all software and virtualized infrastructure, which good reason why someone like Intel is very much involved in this. So what you're gonna see is software-based infrastructure uh, start to supplant hardware in the core, and that's gonna move its way out to the edges to create this edge intelligence. Edge intelligence feeding really the IoT world because at the end of the day, I, the value of IoT is in the knowledge or the data, right? That's the real goal that we want to get out of it, I think, so. Well, the data is key. The question is how do you consolidate data? How do you capture the data? So when you've got thousands of different types of devices, you've got multiple ways to connect. How do you see these things converging such that a, a, a building owner or a property management company or even a carrier can start making intelligent decisions about how to capture the data when you've got all that disparity amongst your infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and Jeff, we were talking earlier, I was saying, you know, your event here this year is, is almost a bit of a melting pot. Uh, we attend a lot of events through the years, and a lot of them are focused on what we'd call the plumbing side of the wireless infrastructure. Uh, but if you look around this event, you know, you, you have a very interesting mix. We now have people from smart buildings, application infrastructure, down through the wireless connectivity side, down into the device side. And, and I think, you know, what's gonna happen is I think the industry is gonna go through um, a cycle of some consolidation. We've got millions of different devices out there. We've got multiple forms of wireless connectivity, arguably some of it competing. Uh, for the space, we've got new standards emerging that will leverage in much of the case, pre-existing infrastructure to enable IoT device connectivity, uh, I think it's going to be a little while before we can really point to something. And I would suggest that, you know, as uh, uh, leaders in the industry, we start to come together and help shape a framework for our target 
collective customers, the enterprise, so that they can, they can rely on some kind of framework to point to and say, these vendors fit into that framework. So building owners and property managers, what I'll call the institutional guys, uh, that own mass majority, the multi-tenant apartments, uh, industrial, office, et cetera, they have not been the fastest technology adopters in the world. So given the increased complexity that IoT brings, what, what advice do you give uh, building owners about how to make technology decisions? And you're saying we have some time? Uh, I got about, <laughs> about the two or three key points that they need to be thinking about. Well, the, uh, uh, you know, I think for, for building owners, I think they need to be looking at, at the end of the day, what are they solving that's going to create more efficiencies with the technology? You know, we live in a world where there's often a lot of technology searching for a home. Right, and I'm sure in our IoT industry we'll be able to surface some of those, which were neat technologies, just kind of surfing for a home. Um, but if I were if I were in charge of running a series of buildings, uh, I'd really be looking at what are the automation systems that are going to make the building more efficient. Where do I get the most gain back, and why is putting something inside that building uh, that is IoT centric going to help me? create greater efficiencies. You really need to look at the whole business case uh, for why these things make sense. Um, the other thing I guess I'd have them look at is, <clears throat> if you're going to put infrastructure in, you need to consider the same infrastructure that supports tenants and their mobile devices, and how can that be leveraged with forthcoming intelligent wireless devices that are going to be either within the tenants or within part of the building. Uh, and you're going to get economies of scale there. Uh, and that's kind of how our industry is coming together on the wireless connectivity side. Really, the, the benefit of economies of scale by common infrastructure. Well, I'm gonna, I, I want to talk about security in a minute, but I want to come back to that question. Uh, you know, for five years, up until this year, DAS was a big topic. You hear the carriers say DAS was expensive. And so you get down to 500,000 square foot, yeah. 200,000 square foot buildings, they simply can't afford a neutral host player to insert themselves in that equation, there are now lower cost in building wireless systems. So let's pretend for a minute that every building can afford a wireless system. What's going to be the pain point or the catalyst for them to actually start migrating some of those automation systems over to this same infrastructure you referenced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you bring up a good point. I think there's, uh, in our industry, there's a bit of a misnomer on, on uh, DAS itself, distributed antenna systems being too expensive to go into the enterprise space. Now, I think a lot of that was weighted on the fact that you had a large scale multi-band, meaning that uh, environments that covered many different protocols in the wireless industry, multiple operators, uh, being contrasted and compared to uh, devices we know as small cells, which are single carrier one or two LTE only bands. Very, very different systems. Uh, as you're aware, we introduced uh, about a year ago something called EDAS, and it's really a, a, a streamlined approach to leveraging the benefits of multi-operator DAS solutions in a building, but it actually gets the price points on a square foot basis down below what it would cost you to deploy a small cell. Now, let's think about that in context of the investment you're making in and where you would take that as there's new technologies coming. First of all, almost every enterprise environment wants multi-operator. I haven't run into almost any that don't need multi-operator environments. So therefore, when you get a common infrastructure that is cost-effective to support multiple operators, that's a desirable approach to take. If you add to that the fact that that same infrastructure you would deploy, you can now add on to it by going in the MDF and not really touching the rest of the building, the ability to light up wireless technologies that are based on LTE standards, suddenly I have an infrastructure that's multi-operator for these devices and a wireless infrastructure that's ready for IoT. So I, I think those are some of the things at least we've seen firsthand uh, the industry's been quite receptive to this approach. Uh, we've done good partnerships with some of the major building management organizations, people like CBRE, uh, and it, it has worked out well to kind of 
resolve some of those issues with them and what they need for the end customer. And in this case, the end customer is the tenant. All right, we're going to get pulled off the stage, but we got to talk about security. So the building owner puts the system in. They start migrating over these um, it, uh, um, older legacy proprietary networks. How do they protect their building? How do they protect their tenants? Yeah, yeah. In one no, minute or less. And, you know, we, we, we never leave a discussion. Almost in any industry do we leave a discussion without talking about vulnerability and security. Uh, you know, for us, as we look particularly at IoT, let's just think about IoT for a minute, because we let these things in the building all day long, right? We've got a security overlay for this. IoT devices show up and you're the guy in charge of running the building, and they can come in and be on your network somewhere in that path, you suddenly get very nervous. So uh, I think from our perspective, the same systems we're talking about where we're, they're going to be ready for IoT, we have defined an approach in our architecture that gives the enterprise a checkpoint that they can control at the edge of their network. Uh, and what that means is that they can create um, a group list, if you will, so only certain IoT devices are allowed to be operational, even though they might be network-ready network IoT devices. So uh, I think that security is going to be an ongoing question. At a, at a higher layer, there's going to be approaches that secure information. At a lower layer, and connectivity layer, there's going to be methodologies that allow you to cl create closed groups on those things. Uh, let's take one question. Anybody have a question before we break off? Right here. Yeah, when you talk about the edge, you start talking about a lot of complexity. Like, you mean the edge of the network, or the network is the foggy? Well, where is the edge, right? Is it foggy? Yeah. So, um, in terms of complexity, um, depending on the building you go into, many of them have a data center. That data center might be at the tenant level, many floors in a building. It might be a, a tenant that runs and owns the whole building, and they've got a data center in the basement. That could be the edge right there, right? It really depends on what you're doing. Now, in the same token, the edge could be a kilometer away in a centralized data center in a city that serves many small buildings. Uh, the reason for the edge is really the big question we all have to look at. The reason for the edge is to either, one, expose certain intelligence that that particular enterprise can utilize to their benefit, or two, eliminate latency because in certain technologies like LTE and in particular in 5G, the, the latency from end to end gets pretty tight, right? And you want that to get good control. So, you have to move things to the edge to achieve that goal. So I think that edge is a little little foggy, but it's certainly closer than uh, in a regional area that's hundreds of kilometers. Has anybody tried to put together that into a standard definition? I think the closest is probably what's been done under mobile edge computing, uh, MEC. Yeah. Okay. Todd, thanks for your time. Thanks, Jeff. As always. Always good to see you. Well, thank you very much.